This is Battleground PA, a Penn Live podcast discussing the issues that matter to Pennsylvanians and documenting the events in the Keystone State and beyond that could shape how you vote in the 2024 elections. Hello, 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 everyone. This is Joyce Davis, Penn Live's Outreach and Opinion Editor, and coming to you with another Battleground PA. We are have a lot to talk about. I don't know how we're going to fit it all in. I am joined, thank goodness, by Rajette Harris, who represents the Democratic point of view, and Jeffrey Lord, who's actually in Washington, D.C., at a very special event, apparently alumni that are associated with President Ronald Reagan. Jeffrey, why don't you start and tell us where you are and what you're doing? Yes. uh, The Reagan Alumni Association is formed of everybody who worked for him in his uh, two administration says governor of California, his presidential campaigns, and then his two terms in the White House. So it, on occasion, it can be a considerable, uh, a considerable group. We gather uh, at this point now, sadly, we've, you know, inevitably lost some people, but we still gather. We gather at the Heritage Foundation over on Massachusetts Avenue, and it is uh, 110% Reagan country for sure. And uh, as I, as I think I said to you, I'm at the point where I have the Ronald Reagan tie and the Ronald Reagan cufflinks, and uh, I'm, I'm duly suited up for this. All right. Well, I, we, we just want to make sure we acknowledge that you're, you're at an important place for an important event. But listen, while you've been in D.C., a lot of stuff has been happening here in Pennsylvania. First of all, our governor has come out with what appears to be a very major address. It's a long one. He had a lot to say. But why don't we start there? I know we're going to get to Trump and we're going to get to the board and we're going to get to Nevada, but let's start right here at home with what Shapiro outlined for his budget. Rajet, I know you were all in it. So tell me, what did you take away as a major thing? Well, the governor wants to definitely invest in a lot of here in Pennsylvania, particularly education. Um, what I thought was interesting, though, is he's not proposing to raise taxes. He's found new revenue sources, such as legal, legalizing uh, marijuana here in Pennsylvania and using money for that to pay for education, um, raise the minimum wage, um, and other type programs in the state. Uh, with gun violence, he wants a whole new department to help uh, counter that. And I'm sure both of, both of you heard of the ruling today with Jennifer Crumbly, uh, the first mother to be convicted um, for the acts of her son um, doing a mass shooting in a school. So as we all know, it's it's been an issue for a while. Um, and as we know, there are states around us who has legalized uh, marijuana and not just medical use, which is legal in Pennsylvania, to help invest in education and other programs uh, in the state. Uh, me personally, I think it's about time uh, Pennsylvania moves up. <laughs> so I was happy to see the new revenue sources that he proposed to well, invest in education. That was pretty incredible. I mean, he said after, I mean, he outlined a bunch of stuff, uh, Jeffrey. I know you might. He's outlined um, really increasing uh, how much direct, they call them direct support professionals are paid. These yes. are people who take care of the most vulnerable folks, sick and, you know, people who have disabilities in their homes and they've been woefully underpaid. I mean, horrible. They can't even get people to do the jobs. And so he's raising that. He's um, he's talking about uh, trying to uh, definitely raise the minimum wage. He's talking about legalizing marijuana. He's talking about health care, housing, elderly subsidies, you know, to help people who are in their homes and all of that. But but here's the thing that really struck me, this issue of starting an office of gun violence. Now, I don't know how Republicans, and that, that's my question, is any of this really going to get past what is likely to be a Republican pushback? Jeffrey, I, I know you haven't had a chance to delve into this, but just hearing this, what are your thoughts? And with all of this, he also says he's going to have, what, billions left over. <laughs> I don't get it, but go ahead. Well, on the, on the gun issue, I, I should say for the record, I am, I am not a gun owner. Uh, I haven't owned a gun since I was about six and had that wider boy special. Uh, but one of the things that I think is true, and I began to understand this politically all the way back there when I was literally a kid in high school, in Allentown, and we had a hot race for the U.S. Senate between incumbent Democrat Joe Clark, who's the former mayor of Philadelphia, 
and uh, con a young congressman from uh, Montgomery County, Republican Dick Schweiker. And in 1968, for those who, who, who weren't around, uh, it, five years earlier, President Kennedy had been assassinated. And in 1968 itself, uh, both Dr. Martin Luther King and Senator Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. Yeah. So gun control, correspondingly, became a big deal and a big issue. What interests me politically, what, what caught my attention at the time was Congressman Schweiker went out of the way to make that a big issue that Joe Clark was coming for your guns, as the phrase would go. Yeah. And uh, it, it took effect. And Senator Clark lost and his reelection based that's on that, which, yeah. which, you know, I began to learn that, you know, other than, you know, places like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, you got a lot of rural areas in Pennsylvania and a lot of gun owners, and they are very highly protective of their of their gun rights. So correspondingly, I think, uh, you, you know, today that the, I think that issue is still in play with a lot of people. And, and you have to be and, very and, careful. And, and, and that I said, there's a whole lot more. Well, that There's said, a whole lot more support now for doing I, something. I, I think that. Governor Shapiro is a very savvy guy. And I don't think, you know, un, unlike Senator Clark, who, as I recall, was more of a, as we might say, a, a liberal ideologue, I, I think that Governor Shapiro is a very practical, savvy politician, and he's not going to venture down some path just for the symbolism of it. But, Rajat, actually, it, it is a pretty smart thing he's done. He's just talking about studying it. <laughs> I mean, really creating an office that will examine and look at the issue, right? Right. And it is an issue. As I mentioned today, the the trial, um, I think that attitudes are changing towards gun violence. And I think the Republicans talking point of the Democrats want to take away your guns. I don't think that's going to work anymore. We want to keep people, particularly our children, safe. Um, and, you know, and there are some things also in uh, Governor Shapiro's budget that Democrats won't like. For instance, as we all know, he supports school vouchers, school choice. And that is something uh, that overall uh, the Democrat Party does not support. Uh, that in general, the Democrat Party uh, supports investing more money in public schools, not taking money away from public, public schools to give to private uh, parochial schools. Mm -hmm. um, so as we see... Um, he's also venturing on his own in some areas such as that, even though he did propose also investing in public schools, uh, that formula problem has not been fixed yet. As we know, the Supreme Court said that the funding formula for our public schools is not equal and our children, they're getting their education is based on where they, they live, their zip code. Yeah, so I think he is trying to fix and correct that through the public school because, you know, just sending everyone to private parochial schools isn't going to fix that. And I'm someone who went to a Catholic high school, and I'm even saying that. We need to fix the funding within our, our public schools. Yeah, well, that, that's a good point, except that a lot of people are arguing it's not just a question of funding. It's also maybe there needs to be some competition in there. You know, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people who support this this other side. Right. The but there's well. some loopholes, for instance. That's what got me into politics is at the Catholic school I was in, I was discriminated against. Yeah. My mom took me to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission to try to do something about it. They couldn't help us because they have no jurisdiction over private parochial schools. The key issue is these schools accept state and federal funds to run. So if they accept state and federal funds, why aren't they under the same regulations? Well, maybe, they should be. maybe that's something that needs to be changed. Schools. Yeah, maybe so, that's one of the things that should be looked at. How do you make sure they're they're serving as many kids as possible? And but we need to talk about the loopholes. These schools can yeah. also pick and choose who they want to accept. Yeah. So these are the concerns that we as Democrats have with taking money away from public schools to give them to these these private schools. Yeah, this is a big deal for Republicans. Though they're all in favor of school choice. You think, and actually that resonates with a lot of people. Kids should. People should have a, a, the ability to say, no, that school is failing. I want to take my kids somewhere where they'll be successful. Well, it does. And, and you know, we're uh, all uh, old enough, with the possible exception of Rosette, to recall that back in the, oh, I don't know, maybe it was the, I don't know, it was the late 1960s or early 1970s, that busing, school busing became a huge oh, yeah. issue. There was a, a, a real racial component to it as well. 
But what it did, among other things, is stir up parents to, in essence, say, you know, my kid, my school choice kind of thing. And you're not going to put my kid on a bus and ship him halfway across town, you know, when he could go to a school, you know, right here. So uh, it is a hot button issue. There's no question. I mean, what could a, po a parent possibly be more sensitive about than their child and the education of their kids? Well, it's being argued out right now in our legislature, which is what it should be. Let's hear, hear all the sides yes. uh, to it and let's try to get to something that really works for kids. That's what we really want to do. But I'll tell you, uh, Rajette, I just don't know how much of a chance what the governor is proposing, you know, whether it really has a chance of passing. I'm seeing now the some of the reaction coming in from Republicans. They're saying, you know, that it's a waste of money. He's going to bankrupt Pennsylvania. And uh, if it's a uh, it's a budget proposal, that's going to ruin this. So I don't know what what are your thoughts about whether this has any chance, any of this has any chance of seeing uh, success? Well, that's one of the problems of having a split legislature. And it's a shame it's like that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Pennsylvania is one of the few states that has a split legislature um, like we do. Um, I'm not 100 percent. I know we're one of the few. Most most states aren't split like we are. But this is the problem. It shouldn't be about the party. It should be about what's best for Pennsylvania's. And I do think that this budget address with the governor um, expresses that because, again, as I mentioned, there are things in there that the Democrat Party aren't even going to like. But he's proposing it because it's what's best for the for the state. So do I think it's going to be passed as is? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately not. Right. But look, look, Ryan Cutler, I'm um, Brian Cutler, who's the House Republican leader. I mean, he had some, it was pretty sharp. He he basically says calls it a phishing scam. <laughs> he says it looks good. It draws you in and makes you believe it's something it is not. Um, and Seth Grove is saying that it's irresponsible and misleading. I mean, those are some tough words. That's not even giving him. A, on other hand, you've, I'm going to tell you, I got a, a, especially a, a statement from the people who are dealing with the people with intellectual and physical disabilities, and they are lauding it. Um, uh, Mark Davis is saying that on behalf of the individuals with IDA and their families, we want to thank the governor for his commitment to address the chronic underfunding this system has endured for decades. And even the governor talked about all of those people seeing those folks who are coming in wheelchairs and every to their offices. And where is their compassion? Where is their heart for addressing this issue? So there's a lot that's going to be debated in these coming uh, months, I think, with yes. our legislature. And, and rightfully so. You know, Joyce, let's, let's move on a little bit. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Don't want to cut you off. Well, I was just going to say, you know, my, my first job out of college was working in the Pennsylvania State Senate staff, the Republican communication staff. And the governor of the day was a Democrat named Milton Schaap. And if I began to sort of learn anything about Pennsylvania government and the way it works, is you have a governor, it could be from either party, but they come out exactly as Governor Shapiro did today with their proposals for their budget. And then, wow, you get all these state legislatures piling on them because they don't like, you know, issue A, B, C, or D. And so these battles, you know, and sometimes it gets to be very dramatic because the, the state, I don't know whether what the date is now, but it used to be that I think they had to have a budget done by July 1st or something of that nature. And it would get so close that well, the pressure was on that, <laughs> to get something done, you know, before, before the, yep. the deadline ran out and the government funding stopped and all that kind of thing. So this is a sort of a uh, an annual circus that goes on no matter who is the governor. Yeah. Very very true. Very that true. Unfortunately, same, but... our folks ignore the deadlines, which you know, not good. But let let's move on because there has been big news with uh, former President Donald Trump. Uh, you know, he has, as you know, claimed immunity, and uh, a three judge uh, federal panel. Uh, actually denied that today. It, it says, um, and in fact, they say such claims are a danger to the nation's constitutional system. The quote here, let me just read, says, at bottom, former President Trump's stance would collapse our system of separated powers by placing the president beyond the reach of all three branches. Uh, they said presidential immunity against federal indictment would mean that as to the president, the Congress could not legislate, the executive could not prosecute, and the judiciary 
could not review, they can't accept that these uh, lines would be obliterated and that a president could do just what a president wants to do. So I don't know what your thoughts are. I'm sure the president, the former president, is not going to be very happy about that, Jeff. So let's let you go first to offer your explanation as to what could be going well, on I, here with that federal court. Joyce, I, I think what's happening when you pull back, as they say, to the 30,000 feet level, we have a situation that it centers on Donald Trump. With reason, I, I might add, because he's, you know, he's not your average politician. But in which I think a lot of the American people see a government of elites, you know, the bureaucracies, the media, I mean, all of this together, going after somebody and lawfare, as I believe the phrase is, going after them to silence them, to, to you know, be done with them, as it were. And this is, in this case... Donald Trump's way of, of fighting back. I'm not at all sure that he's going to win that particular battle, but I think this battle is going to go on. It's going to take many different forms. Here we are at the beginning of a presidential election year. Uh, this is not the last we have heard of this by any means. I mean, I, I think, as a matter of fact, that every time we sit down for battleground, oh, we'll be saying, and what, what, what just happened this week? on this kind of thing. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. Well, let's, let's bring Rajat in here. Rajat, I, I'm sure, I mean, some of us, I mean, really don't want a president to be above the law. <laughs> there are some people that really don't like the idea. But what are, you, what are your thoughts, Rajat? Well, first, you know, I want to make sure our, our listeners know that this was a unanimous decision. Yep, exactly. And the panel was is bipartisan in the sense that one of the appointees of the three panels was appointed um, by President Bush, uh, Father Bush, first Bush. So you can't say it was a panel of judges appointed just of Democrats, and they were unanimous with this decision. Um, we see this abuse of power by authority figures all the time, not just in politics, but no one is above the law. Uh, one of his arguments is, well, I was impeached but not convicted, so this shouldn't pertain to me. It's it's ridiculous. Um, it's 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 just ridiculous. Um, he should have to stand trial and be accountable for his actions as any one of us is. Um, well, also, it's such a serious allegation. Insurrection is a big deal. Uh, yes. To, to be accused of that and to have a president accused of that. I mean, that that cause that should cause us all to shiver, I think. Just, you know, and it's scary to, to me as, as a voter, um, you know, as a citizen, to think that a president would be above the law, whether it's a past president or current, just because they're a president. You know, we forget, and so do our elected. They're there because of us, because of the voters. You know, they serve the people. So it's not a position to be exalted and to be able to do whatever you want to. If anything, you should be a better example to everyone because of the it's it, the position that you have. It's an honor to be voted president of the United States. It's also a responsibility. A yes. Responsibility to, to honor the Constitution. But I will say also, this, though, Joyce. There is one point that you made that caused me to step back. Jeff, are you able, let me just, let me just ask you this. One of the arguments that he's made is that um, if this could open every president to, once you leave office, being prosecuted for something or the other. Now, that hasn't happened in American yes. history, but we are in uncharted waters. Do we need to take another look at how to hold presidents accountable, but also protect them from false prosecution, perhaps? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the fact of the matter is that presidents of the United States uh, have taken the office and run with it, as it were. Uh, when you read, for example, that, you know, I, I'm sitting here in a hotel and in front of me is a gigantic portrait photograph of the Lincoln statue at the uh, in the Lincoln Memorial at the other end of the mall. And when you read the history of Abraham Lincoln and his presidency, he was accused repeatedly of being a dictator and that, uh, you know, he was trying to do this and he was trying to do that and it was illegal and all of this kind of thing. So this kind of thing has been around for a very long time in presidential history. Strong presidents, Franklin Roosevelt comes to mind, Republican Theodore Roosevelt comes to mind. I know that Democrats were appalled at the way Ronald Reagan 
uh, operated on some occasions, the whole Iran-Contra situation, that kind of thing. So I don't think these things like are going Nixon to ever did, disappear. Right. <laughs> I don't, I don't but think we do have they're, examples they're of president who did the right thing now. We do have examples of presidents who did the right thing. I said we do have examples of presidents who did the right yes, thing. For yes. example, Bill Clinton cut a deal, including paying a fine, and he temporarily gave up his law license to avoid possible criminal charges while he was being investigated. So there are presidents that did what was necessary um, to do that we don't see with past President Trump. It's just unfortunate. Well, I think that we're one of the problems the we have with this is one, one of the problems that I think we have, I, I actually think this is a legacy of Watergate, uh, that the notion mm. became common in political circles that you could, you know, go after a president and just so hamstring him that he'd be forced to leave office. And once that happened, the barriers were down. I think Bill Clinton was targeted. Uh, pretty much along those lines. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, certainly Donald Trump has been targeted along those lines. I think there are probably others. Uh, once once we got past the notion that the presidency was not to be revered, but they were going to be targets for their opponents, and, and legally so, uh, I think that's opened a bit of a floodgate here. And that's a that, I think, is a real problem. Well, the whole impeachment issue is now seems to just be thrown up in the air. Everybody's getting impeached now, and it doesn't really mean anything anymore, right? I mean, honestly. But, I, have, okay, I have another we're, overnight we're here, and if I'm, if I'm not careful, I could be impeached for walking around here. So, Exactly. You better watch it, because we might launch it on <laughs> Well, <laughs> just don't climb any fences like people yeah, did. Do do <laughs> Good point. I, I know where I'm that, coming for my bail money. <laughs> We got it waiting for you, but okay, let's move on because we got one more thing we got to talk about in our half hour, and that is they're still yelling, pick Nikki, pick Nikki. She's still in the race. We're dealing with Nevada. What are your thoughts? If she, if she, well, I mean, some people are saying she might win Nevada. I mean, we're taping this right before, but what happens if she wins? What do you think, Jeff? Is that going to scare Trump or anger him anymore? Oh, I think he's just going to keep at it. And I, and, and I may well have said this before in our get togethers, but you know, there was a guy named Jesse Unruh, who was the Speaker of the California House in Reagan's days, Democrat. And he was effectively the boss of the California Democratic Party. And he had a favorite saying that has lived on well beyond his time. And that is, money is the mother's milk of politics. And it is. It is expensive to run for county commissioner, let alone for president of the United States. And what inevitably happens is that when you start to lose if you keep losing, then your donors say, why the am I doing it? Up. And they, right, the and they, they pull their, they pull their money and it, like, becomes a, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. At this point. So, yeah. All right, Rosette, you know, are you scared? Are Democrats afraid of that Nikki might really pull this thing out? Well, I do want to just point out that uh, President Biden did win South Carolina, 93, 94%. Yep. And there were a couple other Democrats on the ballot and actually campaigned. Um, so I think that's showing that the party is uniting under the current president. Nevada is different this year. Remember, it was always caucuses. Yep. Uh, but the, the Democratic government, uh, because of past things and to speed things up, decided to do a primary. Of course, the Republican Party said no. We want to keep doing the caucuses. So both of them were given a choice. Do you want to do the primary? Do you want to do the caucus? Nikki Haley chose the primary. Uh, she's the only one on the ballot. So yeah. obviously she's going to win. The problem is all the delegates are with the caucuses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so That's Trump cool. is going to end up with uh, all the delegates. And as we all know, to win your party's nomination, it's who has the most most delegates. Um, yeah, so that just doesn't seem like democracy. It just shows another yeah. example of chaos within the uh, Republican Party to me. Well, Jeffrey, I know there was one other thing you want to talk about, all the hoop line back and forth over the border, the border bill. And, the, and I mean, we had something that looks like Republicans, Democrats were coming together on. Suddenly it's falling apart. And I'm going to tell you, people are saying that this is just a Trump ploy to keep an issue out there that he can run on. Now, that doesn't well, seem right. I mean, what you, are your you thoughts know, on that, Jeff? I mean, come on. 
Well, of course, I would answer that by saying that Joe Biden upended all of the Trump policies because he wanted to run on his own. So, you know, that game can be played back and forth. But I, I, I just, I, one of the things that I think is, is very important here is, you know, we live, I mean, right this minute, I mean, what, we're, what we are literally doing, you and, and Rochette and I, this minute would not have been possible 30 years ago, right? Technologically, we, we do this, we sit here, we see what people are talking about, et cetera. That's social media at work. And when you have a problem like the border, these images of what's going on, uh, as you know, I'm a Newsmax contributor. I was watching Newsmax yesterday, I think it was, and their border correspondent had video from a drone that they had flying over the area. And I just think that when all of these images of people flooding across rivers and across the border, et cetera, this is becoming a hot button issue that I don't think we have seen uh, before. Uh, you know, generally it is the economy, but wow, I, I think this is a big deal and it's being aided visually by the technology we have. Well, the truth is we, we have several issues. I mean, if you're being honest, the border, I'm not sure how much that plays in Pennsylvania, but Roe v. Wade is huge. I mean, it is. And the economy is supposed to be good. So, so Rajat, we're going to let you have the last word on this. What are your thoughts on, on um, the border or whatever else you think we need to weigh in on? Since we're short for time, I have a, uh, an analogy. Okay. We all, we all have that family member when we go to a family gatherings, reunions, that just likes to bring a lot of drama, that just likes to be the center of attention, that just likes to have an uproar. To me, that's the Republican Party right now. Mm. Um, and the reason why I say that is, you know, Senator McConnell, Mitch McConnell was for this deal. Now, the son, he's not. Um, you either want to be part of the solution or you want to continue just perpetuating the same problem so you can continue to get elected. No one is 100 percent happy with this bill. It has some things that the Republicans have wanted. It has some things with the Democrats. I mean, we're not completely happy either. It doesn't do enough with the Dreamers, for instance. Mm. But what a, that's right. what a compromise is. Everyone's, <clears throat> everyone's not so, supposed to be happy. It's not a final solution, but it's at least a start. And I think the Republican Party, before revealing their own deals, need to decide if they really want to solve these problems. Yes, it does look like they don't want to solve a problem. And I think that's unfortunately the message that many Americans are getting. They don't want to solve the problem. This is a huge issue. Let's just take the first step to do something about it. But they won't even do that. What? I mean, jo Joyce, okay, I said Roger doesn't the... have the last, but you will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll just say quickly that I think part of the problem here was the process. If instead of meeting behind closed doors and doing all this wheeling and dealing, I mean, having worked in the U.S. Senate, it works best when everything is out in the open. They didn't do that so that when it did come out, everybody that doesn't like something is going berserk. If they had opened the process and had Joyce Davis sitting there in the audience uh, for this, taking notes. Yeah, I mean, this would have gone, I think, a whole lot better. They didn't, and I think this is the result. And well, see, we, now we can end on a good note because I actually agree with that. I was just going to say, <laughs> nobody can disagree with Jeffrey Lloyd in saying there needs to be more transparency in yes. politics. So, I Jeff, agree. thank you for that. Thank you, Rajet. <laughs> I will see you next week on Battleground PA. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> bye bye, guys.